Rupa Maria and Raj Patel are the authors of a brilliant new book called Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. I'll be speaking with them in this episode about our current moment as another year begins, as the Omicron variant of COVID-19 rips through beleaguered cities, as climate fires in Colorado destroy almost a thousand homes, despite there still being snow on the ground, and as we somehow still see New Year's resolutions being discussed, as they are every year without fail, even in spite of a pandemic. New Year's, though, as Antonio Gramsci wrote, is less about renewal and more about, quote, turning life and the human spirit into a commercial concern, a sort of gut check moment that's imagined to matter as part of cultivating well-being. But New Year's resolutions are a way of cultivating well-being where we end up thinking, as Gramsci put it, that, quote, between one year and the next, there is a break, that a new history is beginning. But the notion of a New Year's resolution seems nonsensical if we take seriously Maria and Patel's sense that health, in its truest sense, is, quote, an emergent phenomenon of systems interacting well with other systems. So Inflamed is a book that can really help us locate the roots of disease outside of the body in an economic system that generates obscene levels of toxicity and risk. The body, they point out, is really just doing what it's incredibly good at, achieving equilibrium with its environment. The problem is that the environment has become so thoroughly damaged that the work of equilibrium has become corrosive to our bodies. To give you a sense of who you'll be hearing from in this conversation though, Dr. Rupa Maria is a specialist in internal medicine. Her research looks at the ways that social structures predispose certain groups to health or illness. And while Rupa is central to a lot of different revolutionary health initiatives, a few I wanna make sure I mention are her work on the Justice Study, a national research effort to examine the links between police violence and health outcomes in black, brown, and indigenous communities, uh, and her work on the board of Seeding Sovereignty, an international group that promotes indigenous autonomy in response to climate change. Raj Patel is an award-winning author and filmmaker and a research professor in the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. He's worked for the World Bank and the WTO, and he's also participated in global protests against both of those institutions. He served as a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and published on an extraordinary array of things. His first book, Stuffed and Starved, made a big impact on me when I was a doctoral researcher. His second book, The Value of Nothing, was a massive hit, a New York Times and international bestseller. So in this interview, Maria and Patel describe their book, Inflamed, as, quote, a call to advance health through vivid and radical experimentation. The intervention that they've, they've written privileges anti-capitalist, anti-colonialist, and anti-white supremacist perspectives. It acknowledges how important self-care can be in a profoundly exhausting system, but reinforces this idea that self-care is still completely inadequate when the problems we face are so obviously collective. So for this reason, their notion of deep medicine is fundamentally about decentering the individual, learning ways of being a, as they put it, plural being. They ask, you know, what would it mean to reimagine water and land protection as acts of care that crucially upend the logic of private property? They insist that medical professionals be trained to pay attention to the poetics of lived experience. They argue that activists and academics need to co-inhabit the same space and listen to one another, and that medicine must admit multiple strands of knowledge into the realm of legitimacy. So we take up all of these, these problems, these questions, as we navigate the claims of inflamed. Raj points out that we're at a point where democratic governments have proven themselves unshameable. We're at a point where colonial states are deeply attached, clearly, to selective amnesias about history. Thinking about crisis in the way that Inflamed encourages us to means 
trying to wrestle the future out of the hands of psychopathic actors and working to place it back in the hands of communities that can privilege the care of an interconnected system over presentist self-interest. It's either this or we allow what Rupa calls myths of illusion to continue killing us. In the opening chapters of this, this brilliant book you've written, Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice, there's a moment where you write that you're specifically not trying to compose a self-help book, uh, but instead a critique of how the system constrains our choices. Um, and that's, you know, not an uncommon approach in academia, I would say. But what matters, I think, is the strategy, the way you arrange the elements. You know, in this book, you're using data, but also metaphor, storytelling uh, to give this, you know, th this idea of like critical life or death goals that we need to adopt. And I wonder about strategy specifically in this moment and what you might have learned from the political and rhetorical strategies that are used in a book like The Red Deal, you know, because in that book, uh, I mentioned that book because there's a stated sense in that book that, quote, correct ideas are less, less important than ones that, quote, directly nourish our collective movements and that provide people the ability to, quote, theorize and respond to material conditions. Um, so I wonder, is part of the point of Inflamed to offer audiences a picture of runaway inflammation that's less about like getting it right, that technical precision, and more about like targeting the specific systems that cause this runaway inflammation to occur? And this question is to either of you. Um, maybe I could give it to Rupa first. Um, thank you for this great question. It's um something that's really coming up right now around um, these anti-racism diversity experts that have emerged in medicine um, to address the violence of medical racism and who are people who are of the system. They are of the, you know, they're built of the fabric of colonial capitalist medicine, which is what we practice in Western medicine. And um, there is this reaction from black medical students coming into their first year of medical school when they see this. And it's a very intuitive reaction that this is wrong, that this is not consonant with what's happening in social struggles um, that many of them are coming from or communities that many of them are coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I think that exactly this, you know, it actually was our intention to connect the dots in a very literal and, um, and helpful way, um, not in order to be right, but in order to stimulate greater experimentation exactly of the kind that you're just that you're just mm. bringing up that mm -hmm. this is about um, blending multiple ways of knowing admitting multiple strands of knowledge allowing metaphor and um, scientific rigor to uh, co inhabit the same space and to inform our understandings and our realities allowing music a place to um, be situated with the work of, you know, reawakening seeds that have been dormant in our worlds for so long, whether those are literal or figurative seeds. So absolutely, this is a, um, a call to vivid and um, radical experimentation um, in order to advance the agenda for health, um, for what real health means and looks like in its most whole form. Um, so that's how I'd start that and I'll hand it off to Raj. Rupa's exactly right that there's a poetics that we aspire to here that often actually just relies straightforwardly on poetry. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is Again, for, for and I, I love the way you put it, Rupa, that, that, that we're allowing uh, different modes of learning to co-inhabit the same space. Uh, and we're also doing it in a way that makes it very hard for vaccine skeptics and, um, you know, folk who discover science on uh, dark corners of the Internet uh, to get purchase. Because we're not offering a certain kind of relativism where anyone can think whatever they like as long as it's phrased beautifully and there's some reference to mother nature in there. Right. Uh, what, what we've got is 
actually, you know, expanding the the circle of who counts as a peer in peer review and what counts as adequate peer review and what counts as knowledge in that process. Uh, because, you know, essentially what, what we're doing is deconstructing um, what it is that counts as a structured scientific revolution, what counts as uh, adequate peer review, uh, not to, to, to do away with it, but rather to strengthen it and to point out its uh, colonial uh, aporia and to point out uh, that uh, systematically the knowledge of women and indigenous people and people of color uh, has been often correct and ignored because it just hasn't been profitable or because of just sort of straightforward uh, patriarchy and white supremacy. So um, what we're excited about is much more rigorous knowledge uh, in a way that accepts and embraces poetry as knowledge. Um, so, I mean, that that's the mode in which we're operating. And so, you know, I, 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 I think that uh, the correctness of ideas is is, is clearly something for uh, for the logicians to debate. Mm. Uh, whereas, again, you know, what, what we're offering is a poetics that's grounded in uh, an episteme of, uh, you know, that's that's very explicitly anti-colonial uh, and anti-white supremacist and anti-capitalist. Yeah, and palpably so. Like, there's this idea in the book that, you know, evening out distribution, creating balance will produce resilience, right? And that the system we have, colonial capitalism, suppresses that in order to prioritize cosmologies based in bordered thinking, extraction and exploitation. And you just flatly say, like, that's clearly not sustainable. And so I love this idea that it's about experimentation and imagination, not theoretical sophistication. Um, I guess, you know, I wanted to start with the question of like how we define health to some extent. Like when I was doing my doctoral research on childhood obesity, um, you know, I ran into a, a conundrum. You know, I'm doing it from a cultural studies perspective and trying to critique the health establishment for bluntly vilifying fat bodies, but without abandoning health as an ideal. You know, at the time, I didn't have a language for any of that. And my supervisor just basically demanded that I get off the fence and, and abandon theoretical sophistication in order to make a, a clear argument. And I wanted to, I guess, ask you just sort of uh, generally, how do you define health? What, how do you define deep medicine? And how did you get turned on to that notion of deep medicine um, as something that can maybe undo standard medical narratives by which we understand health and illness? Um, I just love these questions. Um... So for me, as a, you know, someone who works in the front lines of this COVID response, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can look at health as, you know, this person's healthy or this person's unhealthy, you know, or this person is, you know, ill, this person's well. Sure. Um, but what, through this process of writing this book and really sitting and thinking long and hard about these ideas with Raj over the last few years, it has become clear to me that health cannot be simply conceptualized along the framework of the individual. It has to be understood mm. as an emergent phenomenon of systems working optimally together um, so that when these systems are, you know, pressing against each other, that what you're seeing as an outcome is thriving, wellness, and not just of one entity, but of the entire system. Um, and that is something that we is so foreign to people who are raised in this cosmology in a colonial capitalist cosmology you know you might feel well in a fancy spa where everything's been engineered around you um, but if you go down the street or you know 10 miles away you'll be near a you know a toxic waste site or you'll see a, a factory spewing noxious fumes into the air or you'll see a river that's been dammed and the salmon no longer run. Um, and so all of these um, realities where what you're talking about, like the borders that have been created through capitalist ideologies, the incarcerations, the the stagnant um, hoarding of resources and movement of resources have, have been very purposefully controlled. That is not a system in health, not only economically, socially, but ecologically. Um, and that is really what we um, started weaving and, and braiding together in this book is understanding that 
all of these things are required a political understanding, a historical understanding, a ecological understanding, a poetic understanding of, of who we are and where we are right now in order to advance a real agenda for health. Um, and so when we look at something like childhood obesity and the rising rates of this, um, we can look at it, you know, through each individual or even a, an individual community. But when we zoom out and look at it over time and over how lines of power have been drawn through certain neighborhoods or through certain populations, then you get a very different reading and understanding of the the things that determined the structural determinants of health. Right. A much more whole understanding. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I call holistic medicine. So, um, and that is where, when you start operating on that level of understanding, your choices become very different in terms of what you do. And that's what Raj and I call deep medicine. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, like, um, you know, this, this notion of holistic in medicine is sort of overdetermined. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you mentioned this a little bit in the book, you talk about like holistic medicine would be great if it was holistic, right? Like you talk about how it's, it's really, um, the opposite in many ways. It's, it's, it's really, you know, aligns perfectly with this very bordered thinking and it's highly consumeristic. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I wanted to, you know, uh, talk about the kind of maybe overarching threats, like the the threat that um, we're constantly reminded of that in some ways the pandemic has been a reprieve from the overpowering threat of climate change um, in the context of inflamed, there is this, you know, growing sense, I think, of the importance of something like deep medicine as a lens for seeing the connections between crises and man-made activity. And in particular, I think there's a, a more robust sense now of the fact that we, all of humanity, are not equally climate criminals. Um, you know, like following the failure, I would say, at the highest official levels of COP26, I wonder if you have a sense that there is any real significance to like the emergent language of climate criminals and climate refugees, um, climate impacts. And if we're maybe moving past the idea that climate change is a universal human problem and into a moment where it might be differently possible to politicize the history of colonial dispossession in relationship to a world on fire. Um, and, you know, I mean, to put it in the language of the book, how can we integrate planetary health into the medical system? Raj, did you want to take this one first? Yeah, well, I mean, having just come back from COP26 uh, right. and seen, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and frankly, have been rendered fairly depressed uh, by it, I mean, it, it, you're right that at the highest levels of government, um, there are ways that uh, you know, so-called democratic governments have demonstrated themselves unshameable. Now, in part, that's just because uh, the architecture of uh, this particular COP was such uh, as to minimize shame. And it was conducted by the British government, which is uh, you know, at the same time as COP was happening, Boris Johnson was flying down from Glasgow to London uh, to have, um, uh, have, have have dinner uh, at the, a gentleman's club uh, where some crazy right winger who's a climate skeptic was trying to persuade him um, not to bother with it, all that stuff happening up in Scotland. Um, right. So this is the context. Yeah, which, yeah. I, I, but, yeah. you know, I mean, more broadly, of course, you know, the, the, right now we have the Indian government being... Uh, blamed for uh, you know walking back commitments around the end of coal. Now you know I, I mm -hmm. uh, fully support uh, blaming the fascists in India and Modi's government for uh, supporting essentially the, the the interests of a coal billionaire in India, a Gujarati coal billionaire who uh, who's one of Modi's friends. Um, but it's also important to remember that the uh, British government uh, pulled out of India in 2020 dollars 64 trillion dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. as, uh, in net present value. And so, um, you know, it's th th these kinds of selective amnesias about history and about uh, what the planet has become and the processes through which it has become what is, it has become are also important to the discussion. Again, this gets back to the idea of deep medicine, whether one blames the victim or whether one understands the circumstances in which, for example, childhood obesity is not something that one blames the child or the child's parents for, but understands as uh, an actually concerted effort to try and 
you know, wring profit out of a particular community, uh, no matter what the cost in terms of children's health. And so, you know, the, the, when it comes to thinking about planetary health, um, you know, I mean, there is nothing that, that cannot be co-opted. Terms like planetary health, terms like zero, you know, net zero, sure. uh, you know, th these are all uh, now terms w which when we hear them, we ought to be incredibly suspicious because they are part right. of the marketing arsenal. I mean, I, I saw HSBC, the, you know, the, the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, as it was once called, uh, this British Chinese bank, um, trumpeting its net zero commitments. And they plan to go net zero by 2050, I believe. Uh, but between now and 2030, hundreds of millions of people will die because of the lending that they're going to do. So, you know, mm. the, these, the, the language and the rhetoric in which the framing of planetary health uh, is being uh, you know, proclaimed uh, is definitely, the, it, sh it should be the stuff of suspicion. Um, mm -hmm. but, but that doesn't mean that there is not at some level a, uh, a fairly widespread understanding that climate, you know, cl the climate catastrophe is uh, about a, 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 an existential threat to the web of life as we experience it, as all humans experience it in one way or another. Now, you're right that some humans are going to be able to insulate themselves spectacularly well. The billionaires will either you know, bugger off to New Zealand or you know, hunker down in their forts or whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. and the, the rest of us will, you know, will suffer as we may. And then for, for folk in the global south, particularly peasants, particularly indigenous people, things are going to get very, very, very bad indeed. And so th there's no uh, universal experience of climate change. Uh, but its existential character and the need to understand colonial capitalism at its heart uh, and to understand that the transformation that needs to happen needs to involve an end to colonial capitalism. I, mean, I think uh, you know, that's going to look different in every circumstance. Um, but the diagnosis, I think, you know, is both contextual but based on these overarching themes of recognizing the, the, the history of what colonial capitalism has wrought. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, certainly, I, I, I think the notion that these governments are unshameable is particularly powerful, right? The Andreas Malm writes in How to Blow Up a Pipeline that the ruling cl class is simply not going to be persuaded um, to dismantle fossil fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And and I definitely, you know, I agree that net zero has become sort of the poster boy of like greenwashing. It's it's It seems to represent a kind of becoming scientific of greenwashing. Um, but... Uh, Rupa, did you want to follow up on that thread at all? Well, just we're seeing this mentality at every level in society. And I'm going to bring it back to what we spoke about at the top of this discussion about medical racism. So people in medicine who are deeply committed to the ideas of dismantling racism in medicine will not actually um, blow up the structures in medicine that are continuing to exact harm not only on our patients, but on our trainees. Um, so much so that, you know, you have black medical students leaving uh, these, you know, fine universities of learning that they've worked their lives to get to, to become doctors, because the training is simply so racist and the um, lack of understanding of um, the struggles of people of color, especially black and indigenous people in this country. And so as, you know, the, those people who are most impacted, the communities that really should be centered in these issues and in this work are becoming more vocal, more, more vociferous. Um, you'll find these people who claim to be allies or claim to be in alignment. Yes, we need to do something about climate change. Oh, yes, we really should do something about medical racism. Dig in their heels and actually not show up. Um, and that's the real, you know, that's that, you know, which side are you on moment that we're seeing all right. in every sector of society right now. And for me as a, as a doctor, um, as a health worker, as someone who sits near people as they're dying and who walks families through that process, it's unconscionable um, to be aware of the harm and to be, um, you know, digging in one's heels on the wrong side of history. Wow. That, I mean, that's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there, but I guess, you know, I wanted to, just for listeners that maybe aren't totally familiar, I wanted you to maybe expand on and perhaps define medical racism. I mean, in the book, you talk about how the, the, the field of medicine is profoundly white. Um, and this seems to be part of it, but, you know, you write in the book that medical anti-racism must be led by communities of color and must start from the beginning. 
And I wonder what that represents for you, starting from the beginning. I mean, um, if people want, for example, to start decolonizing medicine, where can they start? And is it possible to do that without, you know, co-opting, for example, indigenous practices or, you know, practices you're adopting from communities that maybe are outside of the medical establishment? Yeah, to me, decolonizing medicine isn't adopting somebody else's practices. It's starting with listening, like really deeply listening and understanding um, where where um, the harms have happened and how they have been codified and reified in the practice of medicine. And I'll give an example. When I was called to Standing Rock by California Native people who were out there in the protest camp, and they knew of my work looking at racism and police violence. And they said, you know, Rupa, can you please come and be with us because the police are getting more and more violent out here. So I went out there and was asked by the grandmothers to help coordinate the medic response. And one day there was a young man who was shot at close range by a um, by a rubber bullet, um, which, you know, went into his chest and he you know, they were shooting young youth, bare chested youth in the chest, in the groin, in the face. Um, so we had lots of eye injuries. And, and this kid had a huge like uh, bruise on his back um, and ended up coughing up a whole cup of dark red blood into his hand. And at the camp then, it was just myself and a trauma surgeon who was um, also indigenous, uh, Jesse, Dr. Jesse Turner. And we looked at this young man and we're like, you have to go to the hospital because I had read about all the weaponry they were using before I went to camp. And I've been studying the um, different kinds of quote, non-lethal um, weapons that police are now using as they're becoming increasingly militarized across the country. And um, rubber bullets can cause uh, hemorrhage, um, so exsanguination of, um, by rupturing the pulmonary artery when shot at the chest at close range. And so we were worried that this young man was going to hemorrhage into his chest. And we said, you know, you have to go up to Bismarck, which was the closest level to trauma center that could have handled such a, such a thing. And he flat out refused. And we're like, you have to go up there. He's like, you know, they are so racist up there that if I'm going to die, I'd rather die here with you than die up there surrounded by those racists. So the experience of indigenous people in North Dakota, um, so Lakota, Dakota, Mandan, Arikara, all these different communities who for the last several hundred years have been um, under the, the violence of the presence of white settler colonial violence, right? They're, they're, they live with that every day. Um, they would rather be in a camp where we didn't have any, um, you know, ability to actually take care of him. And that to me was, you know, first of all, knowing I couldn't call 911 for support because those were the people shooting the bullets into the chest and faces of these young people. I couldn't reach out to the Vern ambulance because that they would take them to a, a place where indigenous people didn't feel safe and didn't feel respected. And so, um, so much so that they would rather be there in a precarious situation with two doctors, you know, in the middle of a field. Um, because it's, yeah, more human, more, more yeah. uh, whole, more whole, more respectful. Yes. He felt seen, yeah. he felt respected, he felt cared for. And the right. fact that a huge percentage of our population does not feel cared for, and you don't have to be black or indigenous to not feel cared for in this system because even the very act of being a patient, you know, most doctors will interrupt their patients by 11 seconds of an encounter. We've been trained not to um, prioritize the experience, the lived experience, the poetics of another person's life. We've been trained to ignore that for our expertise. We're not the expertise expert in anybody else's life. Um, and that is, um, you know, the, the process of decolonization is really um, learning to flip that on its head to recenter your humility, your place of learning and, and understanding what other people's experiences are and bringing to bear and service the, the things you can bring and can use. Um, but to do that through practices of, um, you know, humility and also recognizing that people's bodies have been injured by the power structures 
uh, that we're seeing in front of our faces. And they're not just, that's not a fait accompli. That's not something that happened mm. 200 years ago. It's happening every single day. Right. As, as a, yeah, an outgrowth of the built environment. I totally agree. And I mean, just hearing you describe this, this idea, like it, it captures so much of the like passion and perceptiveness of this book, right? Like this is a book that says like the deep medicine in Black Lives Matter is knowledge of multiple forms of social division. To me, these are incredibly energizing ideas, especially as we now confront, um, you know, in, in just the incontrovertibility of the the state's monopoly on the use of force, the the fact of police brutality and structural racism. I mean, and, and beyond that, uh, you know, the the violence of a settler colonial state that regards water protectors as threats to the bottom line, um, and will use whatever means necessary, right, to to push push through these pipelines. There are so many sobering facts in the book. And, and there's no shortage today of these kind of staggering details of contemporary capitalist infrastructure's destruction of life. I mean, The Economist posted on Instagram not that long ago that almost 9 million people die every year from air pollution. Um, you know, you, you talk about, for example, the fact that, um, you know, if, if we want to move out of the tyranny of doom scrolling, we kind of need to radically reimagine healing itself, like repair. And abolition for you is like a way out. You know, it's it's not about, and this is maybe like the popular conception, I don't know, of abolition. It's not about um, uh, shutting down social relations or social institutions that allow life to flourish. Abolition for you is about, I think, building them up anew. Um, and, and yet, you know, in the book, and I'm getting to a question, I'm sorry, <laughs> that um, no one imagines this situation is going to get better. No one imagines this situation is going to get better. Is part of the point of the book to simply to get people to register that the perceived ordinariness of mass death might be part of the problem, that they should be troubled by limitless growth if an extinction event is maybe the consequence of limitless growth? Like, is it about trying to shake up that tyranny of doom scrolling on some level and, and you know, move people out of that, that acquiescence almost to mass death? Raj, did you have anything to say on that point? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, the, 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 just as a sort of quick coda to uh, the idea of, of just co-opting indigenous practice. I mean, you know, co-opting indigenous practice is colonialism, right? I mean, you know, that, that's how colonial medicine works is by stealing indigenous ideas and then uh, repurposing them as uh, modern medicine. Um, but the the practice of, uh, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the goal of this book is precisely to point out that uh, medicine is not that, uh, you know, the, the benign force that comes alongside colonialism and sort of mops your brow after the soldiers have had their wicked way with you. But you know, medicine is part of the same structure and it, it comes freighted with the same racism uh, and it ignores the same practices of healing and care uh, that the rest of, you know, uh, colonial capitalism does because medicine is incapable of recognizing it as it's currently co constructed. Um but the the goal of the book is not just to to point out that that colonial capitalism uh, you know, rigorously enforces its cosmology every day and requires fealty to you know in the United States for example making children say we live in one nation under God um, you know and that that's just legally incorrect uh, the United States is uh, recognizes hundreds of indigenous nations uh, and so to say that, that this is one nation under God is 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 palpably incorrect um, but more than that uh, more than the sort of politics of unlearning uh, well the politics of just uh, obfuscation when it comes to sort of seeing the world around us what we're trying to do is point out that there are practices of healing that are being uh, that, that, that every day are being mistold. Hmm. So, for example, the Indigenous Environmental Network points out that uh, over the past decade, uh, because of Indigenous pipeline struggles, uh, between uh, around 25% of US emissions were either delayed or kept in the ground as a result of this, the, you know, the, the, the direct actions that Rupa was a part of. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that's uh, treated increasingly as terrorist activity, and um, in the United States, and obviously, uh, you, know, you see increasingly the, the criminalization of protesters and water defenders. But what we're pointing out here is that 
the, you know, the, the water defense and the defense of land is an act of resacralization, uh, an act of extending new, uh, 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 an act of practicing care for the land and for future generations. Now, that act of practicing care overrides things like private property. Uh, and, you know, again, what one of the characteristics of private property uh, is the, the right to, de- to destroy it uh, mm-hmm. under capitalism. And what, you know, what, what these acts of resacralization and of care from indigenous communities, but from, you know, care revolutionaries the world over points out is that, no, this isn't terrorist activity. This is care. This is love. And this is an approach to decolonizing medicine uh, and decolonizing our planet that is about extending our capacity for care beyond uh, you know, people who look like us towards uh, beings and people who do not look like us at all, who, you know, beings like rivers, beings like uh, the soil, beings like microbes. And those acts of care and those acts of memory towards ancestors and those acts of love towards future generations uh, suited together in uh, a defense of land and water are reasons to be optimistic. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, the, the book is not like we're all going to hell in a handbasket, despite the fact that, you know, COP26's latest proposals uh, absolutely commit us to a world that's, you know, above two degrees Celsius warming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what, what we're doing is pointing out that there are reasons for hope uh, in different cosmologies. And what we have to do is unlearn uh, capitalism's cosmology in order to be able to see it. Right. And, and that this is and that this is both a hopeful time in a very hard time because um, at the, you know, as we re-engage with these new old narratives, these these old new ways of being, knowing, um, and learning through acts of care, um, we are bringing forth. So we are midwifing, we are doula-ing um, a, a new way into being. Um, and by new, I mean, I am, you know, here as a Punjabi uh, settler on stolen, unceded, occupied Ohlone land. And, you know, I'm here because my my family was was, were refugees of colonial terror from our own homelands. And so here I am as diaspora, here I am as orphaned from my own homelands with community who have been orphaned from their own homelands, our indigenous friends who don't even know, you know, their ancestries because they've been erased by the missions. Um, the levels of violence have been so complete and deep. And yet there are still the hummingbird and the redwood tree and the oak tree and the mountain lion and the lynx here on the land that we're working to um, support the rematriation back to indigenous Ramatish Ohlone women here in this area. And so that, you know, in that work, you know, that, that we are in a situation where sociopathic, psychopathic, murderous people are determining the fate of the majority of the human race. And so if we want a different outcome, it will require struggle and on every front, on the, um, you know, cosmological front, on the material front, it will require real, like resting these resources back into the hands of people who will care, not just for themselves or their communities, but the entire system. And that's why for this book, it was really important to articulate our vision of health which is an emergent phenomenon of systems interacting well with other systems that you can't just isolate and atomize these things as capitalism has forced us to do around the entire globe. And that we are, we are now living with, you know, 600 years of this knowledge system in place and intact. And we have to question and query it and, and push it and erode it and corrode it at at every level through um, all sorts of different kinds of actions. And so um, that's, you know, the ability to imagine the full range of what those actions can be and look like from the tenderest um, act of care in like mutual aid with COVID um, to, you know, drilling holes into a pipeline to render it un- inoperable. There's all mm-hmm. sorts of levels and, and ways in which, you um, 
we have to 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 behave to preserve our um, ability to be healthy in the future. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea that Raj points out that there are methods of healing that are being untold. I think really, you know, you're you're bringing that to bear and kind of describing ways of 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 you know engaging with these with these times, which are as you say both hopeful and hard. Um, you know, it, it, we can't resign ourselves to the psychopathic people who are, as you say, in control of our, our destiny. And so it becomes necessary as you're doing it in this in this book to kind of, um, yeah, slowly erode that cosmology. And one of the most impactful themes in the book is this recurrent sense that like forests are magic, like in a medical sense, magic. Um, and, you know, this is something that Anna Singh and others have written about this, this idea of like the arts of noticing. Um, you describe like the cultural practice of forest bathing in Japan, um, the, the, you know, a means of seeking the anti-inflammatory properties of nature. Um, these are things that we might not be able to kind of quantify, but that our bodies in their kind of holistic intelligence seek out. Um, and, you know, early on in the book, you say one of the maybe original sins of capitalism was to transform the forest from a home and life world into a thing that could be privately held and exploited. And I guess, you know, the first thing I wanted to ask is, like, to what extent you're invested in this idea of sort of the arts of noticing the, the transformative effects of just trying to, you know, be in relationship to the land. You know, the book concludes with this beautiful dialogue in which you both relate that you've tried to cultivate a sensualist's approach to the land. Um, is that about trying to break down that those barriers that exist, these category errors that define under capitalism our relationship to the world? Yeah, I would say for for myself, it it, it is about reconnecting what has been broken through centuries of violence mm -hmm. that have led me to the illusion that I am not the earth, that she is not me, that we are not in deep relationship, and that my life is not somehow completely dependent on whether or not the entity underneath my feet is thriving and well. So these, these um, myths of illusion are killing us. Um, the idea that we think that we can be well if our water is poisoned, that we can be well if our indigenous people are not practicing their ceremonies on their lands, if they're not sovereign on their lands. The idea that we can be guests in someone's lands and walk around like we own the place when we have no you know, long relationship with these areas. Um, so in, on every level, our sense of who we are in relationship to other entities has been um, created in order to drive this economic engine and process. It doesn't bring more power to my community and my friends and the people and things I value. And so the art of noticing, the art of sitting and just sitting with a field that you're going to, you know, move into cover crop, that you're going to start growing food to feed your community, that art of watching the field, waking up at five in the morning and sitting for three hours and seeing who comes to the field. What does it sound like? Can you hear the sound of the seeds as they break open um, and start mm -hmm. germinating? You can hear the sound of seeds germinate. I never knew that until I spent wow. some time <laughs> just like noticing, right? Wow, wow, I can hear the seeds germinate. The patience that would be required to do that. Well, just yeah. the, I mean, first of all, you have to allow yourself to be economically unproductive, um, right. which is a great thing yeah. to practice. Um, but that also requires a great deal of privilege, right? So how can we create space for all of us to be economically unproductive and completely um, generative of health for one another mm -hmm. and for the systems that we live in? Um, so that, you know, I, I do believe that we have to reattach on, on repair all of our relationships and starting with the earth is a great way. Mm -hmm. And Raj, did you have the same kind of journey? I mean, you're, it was your line about having a more sensualist uh, approach to, I suppose, nature. Well, but it's also, um, you know, I mean, uh, sensualism is uh, or can be entirely individual. And uh, sure. I think what one of the things that we're, we, you know, we've learned in our journey is that there are people ready to teach if we are ready to learn. And those people may be human uh, and they, they may not be, but there are certainly ways uh, that 
folk are economically unproductive on a Sunday, for instance, if uh, you know if, if folk are lucky enough to have a a, a, you know, a week job and are not part of the, the gig economy where Sunday is a work day. Um, but you know, to 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 understand that. Um, there, there can be practices of resacralization that allow you to see new things um, and that expand the gamut of your senses. Uh, so, you know, for, for example, a, a, again, a, a recent Via Campesina meeting that, that I was lucky enough to attend, there were, um, you know, before the conversation started, there was this sacred time for people to bring gifts and to bring gifts of soil or seed or song or uh, reminiscence or an, uh, a, a call from the ancestors or a prayer or whatever it was, or, or just an invocation to the four directions, Wh whatever it, the, 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 there was just in the, the, the process of folk from different nations uh, coming together and giving things, um, there was uh, just new dimensions of sensuality that were opened, not through uh, you know, uh, the uh, any, any kind of inward looking, though I, I think that that's in, tremendously, you know, that's the corollary of um, the, the sacred time that we spend together in, uh, you know, what is now called church, but, you know, in, in the church of uh, the, the, the sacred world, in, in the sort of under the arc of, um, you know, uh, Sky Woman. And so I, I think that that's, uh, all of this is to say that, that I, I think that that's, you know, the argument we're making in the book is that, that this process of sort of decolonizing oneself is never only about therapy. It's not just about taking, uh, you know, just sort of sitting on the couch and, and recounting um, trauma, uh, but rather to understand that this is a, a collective process in which we can be led uh, and which we can in turn, after tutelage, lead. But it's something that is collective. Hmm. Absolutely. And it, it makes me think about a, um, an incredible piece that Melanie Yahtzee wrote uh, for Baffler entitled Traumatic Monologues. In it, she says that even progressive politics ignores healing and justice in favor of the elucidation of suffering itself. So in some sense, what you're talking about, Raj, like just listing traumas, like privately listing traumas, her sense, and it's, I think, one that you share is that we need to, quote, reclaim healing from the neoliberal individualism afforded to trauma and injury. So like in the Red Deal, Yadzi and her co-authors write that we need to inject collective care into, quote, life-affirming mass movements that can topple global capitalism once the conditions of the pandemic lift. Like that's a powerful statement and one that stands definitely in opposition to the sort of isolated self-care that we're encouraged to adopt, I think, generally in the West. So like, you know, if you're watching the Netflix documentary, Fantastic Fungi, which explores some of the ways that psilocybin mushrooms and DMT are like used therapeutically to treat a variety of conditions, you might get the sense that all you need to do is go forage for a psychotropic experience and you'll be healed. You actually hold out hope and inflame that the current fervor over mycology might not be misplaced, that things like psychedelics could correct our vision, as you put it, undoing the alienation from one another and from the land that's been constituted through this long imposition of a colonial mindset. Um, I guess, like, in what sense do you want deep medicine to be read specifically as an antidote to individualistic forms of, quote unquote, self-care? Well, self-care is totally critical. Um, speaking as someone, you know, who who has to take care of myself to do, you know, to just function as a frontline provider um, in this pandemic. Right. But self-care is not enough um, mm -hmm. for the scope of the problems we're facing. And so, if we want to have different outcomes for the problems we're facing, we have to engage in deep medicine which is, you know, as eco uh, deep ecology moves away from centering ecology as a human centered experience so that, you know, ecology is viewed through the lens of the entire system as opposed to just how it can work for humans. That's deep ecology. Mm -hmm. Deep medicine is moving away from the centering of the individual and understanding that we have to work for the whole system to be healthy because you can't leave the global South unvaccinated and expect that this pandemic is going to end. And when you talk about, you know, well, when we get over the pandemic, I don't really see how this is going 
I don't really understand what the end game is. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the CDC just this week said, oh, we're not we're not working for herd immunity anymore. Right. You know, we, we haven't gotten enough people vaccinated and now we don't have enough people booster sh with booster shots. And now there's 80 percent of the deer that are being tested are now a deep reservoir for this virus, which means it'll continue to mutate in these deer and then pop over to humans, perhaps, Unbelievable. Um, you know, and so this is this is the new normal and we will learn how to move and manage. Um, and through that, we can see opportunities to practice different kinds of care. Um, and that with the lack of care, leaving people out of the umbrella, out of the circle, we'll just continue to harm ourselves. And that's, you know, that's what we're seeing with this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, Raj, did you want to follow up on that? Yes. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, w we certainly take aim at wellness um, because, you know, the, uh, wellness is precisely the, the sort of capitalist uh, approach to ministering to the injuries that capitalism itself causes uh, and then offers you an app for that, uh, whether it's the app that stops the blue light from going into your brain at night or the app that helps you sleep or the app that helps you wake up or the app, uh, the app um, to which you can confide your deepest, darkest secrets and then press delete. You know, all, all of these are approaches to wellness that are not the same thing as selves care, if you like. I mean, you know, we, we talk in the book about how by the end of the book, you will understand yourself as a more plural being. Uh, and that you know, the, the ethic of the care of self that Foucault, for example, uh, is excited about is the tending of the self for neoliberal purposes. To, you know, the, 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 the art of individuating yourself and recognizing yourself as an atomic being ready to be governed by the liberal state. And we're not into that, um, but we are into the idea of love and love for the plural beings that we are uh, and that inhabit these bodies uh, and that... Uh, currently kind of focus out through uh, uh, what appears to be a singular consciousness. But the, the care of those selves and those beings are, are central to what it is that we're arguing for in, in Flame, mm -hmm. uh, because it is through the tending of the, the many beings that live in and uh, on and through us uh, that we get to, to nurture uh, our relationships with, with one another and to practice these ideas of care that have been atrophied in, uh, in you know, under colonial capitalism. And the idea of self-care is precisely to stop giving a shit about everything else and to start understanding that, yes, I am the being that does the shopping. I am the being that pay gets paid the bills. I am that this, this body is this person, is this thing that is governable. Uh, and I, I think, you know, particularly in this late stage of capitalism, ungovernable plural bodies are an, an, an essential part of resistance. And those bodies need to be cared for hmm. and yeah i mean self-care is a, a a term that um is more complicated than it i think appears to be on the, on the surface and i think rupa that's why you talk about it like how it's actually vital i mean there there are obviously spaces in which it's like a, a survival strategy but we need as you say it's also inadequate and so um you know the question becomes i suppose what what forms of care um do we do we need in the current moment um, and there's certainly a lot of, um, you know, discussion of that in the book, but, you know, we've now kind of, you know, come to the, the question, I suppose, of how we're, how, how we're going to, you know, reconcile ourselves with the fact that a staggering number of people have died from this, this virus, COVID-19, and, and will continue to die, right? With no, as you, as you say, Rupa, with no uh, conception of how it is going to end. And you write in the book that microbes, quote, rarely get the credit they deserve for holding our planetary system in order, right? The sheer power of microbes. It seems as though this growing body of literature that I've, I've sort of said, you know, I, I've seen emerging um, is about trying to expose the systemic edges and structural weaknesses that the coronavirus reveals. Um, and each of these texts that I'm reading, so Benjamin Bratton's The Revenge of the Real, for example, argues for a kind of positive biopolitics, right? He's like taking up Foucault and arguing for a kind of um, recuperation of biopolitics and a statist biopolitics as just a survival mechanism. Um, but what I'm also seeing, and Inflamed is in this category, is 
uh, an identification of the ways in which the neoliberal state and especially a revanchist right populism is the real reason for the calamitous global response to this virus. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask, like, how do you see Inflamed potentially positioned alongside these other books like Bratton's Revenge of the Real or The Red Deal that are, you know, arguing for a potential direction forward? Like, do you think you're conceptualizing, for example, of um, the exposome and the ways that our built environment is governed by a colonial mindset, a sense of supremacy over life might offer a specific sort of explanatory power. And, you know, like, so that's one, one side of the question, right? Like this concept of the exposome, what does it offer this emergent discourse around COVID-19? But then also, do you think it's possible that the disruption that COVID has created might spill over into a new consciousness of the microbe? It's, I think it's too early for me to understand where this book will be situated amongst these other, you know, really important works coming out. Um, That's fair. But I will say that what we hope to do is offer a way of connecting the dots that will provide a map or at least a multilingual cartography Mm. of what health what is required for health so that we don't become satisfied with masking and vaccination when what we need is a systems overhaul mm -hmm. so that we don't uh, assuage ourselves that, oh, we did good enough. We just lost millions of people, right? Um, so we can think of, you know, what is our ideal, um, what are our wildest dreams of what health could look like now mm -hmm. that the, that the planet is on fire? How do I imagine health for my two sons living in California when it's on fire every year um, for weeks at a time where you can't go outside because the air is so bad? Um, what, you know, what does that look like? And so I hope that this book in explaining very clearly how the exposome, the sum of our life exposures, but also intergenerational exposures are being translated down into the molecular language of our cells in ways that generate every disease I take care of at UCSF in the hospital, from cardiovascular disease to stroke to Alzheimer's to COVID, that all of these diseases are diseases where the immune system has been primed to an inflammatory response. And so instead of giving everyone insulin and giving everyone the latest pharmaceutical to treat the inflammation, what if we were to reconstruct the exposome? Because what Raj and I offer in this book is a level of diagnosis that situates disease outside the body. That we're not saying our bodies are unwell. Our bodies are doing what they were designed to do, mm -hmm. which is to harmonize with our environment. And if our environment has been structured through colonialism, through white supremacy, through patriarchy, through capitalism, our bodies will be sick in this very patterned way. And so as we move forward and dreaming a new world, as this world collapses and we start to see the systems, um, you know, heaving, can we be more um, purposeful and thoughtful and, and active in saying, actually, no, that's not acceptable because that will do my, my family and all of my community to diabetes, to obesity, to Alzheimer's. Um, we won't accept that air pollution here. We won't accept that dam here. We won't accept the death of our salmon. We won't accept the pollution of our water. Um, we won't accept the you know, degradation of our women. Um, so when we when we can start to see how each uh, co uh, concession has brought the summation of a complete system of inflammation, then we can start taking back those things and saying, actually, that's a, that was a step too far. This is a step too far. We're taking this back. We're taking this back. And what that looks like is, you know, recombining like deciding together that together none of us are well if the water is unwell none of us are well when the earth is sick none of us eat well when the soil has been poisoned and so um if we want to be healthy it's not just who has access to the you know 
to the doctor and the pharmaceutical company who can get the drugs to mitigate the harms of these, but that there's a much simpler way of doing it, which is to um, not screw up the exposome in the first place. Hmm. Pull at the root, right? In this abolitionist kind of way, um, rather than merely reacting continuously. I mean, this notion of multilingual cartography is so evocative and reminds me of a, a, like, I think maybe my favorite line in the entire book, Rupa, during the dialogue, where I think you say, the identity that feels the most whole is the most fluid, right? And it seems to align with this larger kind of conception of plurinationalism, right? Like a, a borderless sort of way of approaching social reality, basically. So, yeah, um, one of the things that I was hoping we could talk about is the importance of storytelling, as you conceive it in the book. Um, Sylvia Winter has this elaborate theory of how humans are both biological beings and storytelling animals. Um, She argues that emphasizing one over the other just doesn't make any sense. And Inflamed, in some ways, is arguing the same thing. You describe the relationship between stories and social memory within indigenous communities, you talk about the, and this is like maybe the most interesting, I mean, that's, you know, a really powerful idea, but the thing that I guess I resonated uh, with most in some ways is the emphasis in the book on the importance of visions of care and repair just broadly, and the need to kind of push those visions toward justice, um, you know, because I've been reading a number of books that that are part of this, you know, genre of climate fiction or cli-fi that are trying to offer visions of, in some cases, disaster, but in other cases, care and repair. You know, Amitav Ghosh's Gun Island is an example, or Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future. Um, You know, I think one of the things that Robinson and Ghosh both do is to help us visualize the uneven impacts of climate change and the role of capitalism in in just like keeping the incinerator running. Right. Um, And I, you know, I read this one line from Inflame that made me think of in particular of ministry for the future, where you write that climate change wrought through racism will be felt through the skin. You know, when I read that line, all I could think about was the first chapter of Kim Stanley Robinson's book in which victims of a wet bulb event describe being turned into cooked things themselves. Um, And I wonder, first of all, if, if you've read these kinds of texts, these climate fiction texts, and, and just generally, if you have a sense of like the power this kind of storytelling can have and why we don't yet have stories like this that come from visual culture, like why hasn't visual culture caught up to climate fiction, do you think? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, oh, gosh, I have no idea why visual culture and even musical culture. So like there's so yeah, many realms of our imagination that haven't been engaged um, but the storytelling is so critical and it's happening. You know, um, hundreds of people died of heat last year in the Northwest. Yeah. They died of heat. And that is, again, and then it sets off an inflammatory cascade in the body. Um, and so, uh, you know, literally cooking. And we saw this in San Francisco when we had, you know, two days where it was 106 degrees, two, day, two days in a row. And the hospital where I work in doesn't have, it didn't have air conditioning. And so we were literally, you know, San Francisco, you don't need air conditioning. No one has air conditioning in San Francisco. Um, But these two days where it was 106 degrees, two days in a row, the emergency room was aligned with people. And we saw people come in, you know, with heart attacks who had totally normal coronary arteries. We saw people coming in who were otherwise healthy, who had bone marrow failure because of the temperature. Um, and that was just wild to see how this experience was being written in the body. Um, and so I don't know why we don't have that storytelling. Um, I think there's been a great uh, sense of, you know, the hugeness of the problem that it's hard for people to grasp it. Um, but then, you know, when you look at the micro, like just a local experience of climate change in different communities, you see these really real stories, um, that are so critical. And when you think of the history of humanity, weather events, extreme weather events play such a major role in human 
history and human mythology and epic story like these great floods um the emerging of people out of the water um fire um so these these are cataclysmic events are are we are living through you know the beginnings um of truly epic times that you know if you know god knows what it's going to be like in 200 years um but this will be a an important time of like well what were they thinking and did they see what was coming and how did they how did they frame it how did they understand it um Mm. and so that that is really the time you know i think about that as a musician as someone who refuses to submit myself to a categorization of my identities or my 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 works like the things i do in the healing practices i engage in but i think about how music reaches the brain in such a deep way that even you know story can't reach which is why so many so many stories epic stories that cultures wanted to survive were made as songs um, and that in the song, there is this way of reaching memory that goes far deeper in the human organism brain consciousness. Um, and so what are the seed songs that we can write right now that will tell of this time that will, what, that will tell of what went wrong and how to never do this again? Um, and so that's what I've been really thinking of, um, you know, it's, in, yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm genuinely, I've, I've, um, you know, started a, an essay myself on the music of climate change. Um, that's I've, I've titled the essay songs of prescience, because there's a way in which these songs are attempting to, you know, prophetically, uh, imagine for us the very fiery future that we face. And, you know, so I, I, I share that, that desire for a musical language to convey like climate anxiety and potentially hope or anger. And it does seem to be emerging, but, but sort of slowly and at the same time as um, a different sort of uh, musical language around climate change that is primarily about like uh, what I feel is a kind of vacuous spiritualism, like Love Song for the Earth, for example, this collaborative song, like you know, those are lovely, um, but they don't actually um, engage with climate anxiety in any real way. And I think music that does that could, as Imra Zeman and Nicholas Brown put it, synchronize us into a social body. Mm. I'm sorry to keep you. No, 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 no. This was great. Thank you. Thank you for making the time. Thank you so much.